the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. So we're here today on Titans of Nuclear with Ken Edelman, who's an author, but also the former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and Arms Control Director for Ronald Reagan. Ken, welcome to Titans of Nuclear. Well, thank you very much, Brett. We'd love to hear about your incredible career, uh, but why don't you start us off at the beginning? Tell us, where were you born? I was born in Chicago, Illinois, at a very early age, let me say, and uh, on the south side of Chicago and uh, then went to Grinnell College in Iowa, right in the middle of Iowa. And do you remember any formative experiences growing up that would have led to the career that you'd chosen? Well, I, I, after the career that I had chosen, and chosen is uh, making too much of it, to tell you the truth, uh, <laughs> the career that just happened, to tell you the truth, um, you know, then I look back at it and on Tuesday mornings at Bryn Mawr Grammar School, we would have a drill to go down the hall and get on our knees and go into, put our heads in the locker because uh, there was a going to be a Soviet nuclear attack on Bryn Mawr Grammar School. And I remember doing that a few times and then asking Miss Sinnott, our teacher, uh, how do we know that the Soviets are going to attack on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock Chicago time? And she assured me that the principal, Miss Mulroy, knew about that. And then I told, I asked her, well, you know, my head is in the locker, but my fanny's still in the hall. So won't that get burnt up and <laughs> destroyed? She says, no, as long as your head is in the locker, your uh your safe so that was kind of an early uh dealing that i had with nuclear weapons i guess yeah it seems like a lot of people um had similar experiences around that era um but it is interesting to see you kind of tie it back to what would come later so how did things progress throughout college and, and afterwards uh well i went to uh georgetown for graduate school in foreign service i was interested in international affairs and foreign service and then um, by chance I needed a government job and <laughs> and joined the Commerce Department and then the Office of Economic Opportunity and a very young Don Rumsfeld was in charge of the office 28 year old Dick Cheney was special assistant we had uh, Bill Bradley there we had Chrissy Todd Whitman there we had Frank Carlucci we had all kinds of wonderful people there and um, that was all by chance. And then, you know, from then on, um, we, <clears throat> I worked for Rumsfeld three times in my life. We became very good friends with the Cheneys for many, many years. And, uh, and <clears throat> have the friendship now, I'm happy to say. And- um, But how, how, how did, you're skipping over the, the details <laughs> of how you developed expertise and political relationships. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know if it was expertise in political relationships, but I, I, I did get a master's and a doctorate from Georgetown University. We went over to Africa and uh, because I was a dependent husband, my wife was in the Foreign Service and I was one of the first dependent husbands in the Foreign Service. And people have said, oh, but that must have been humiliating. Or I said, no, it was delightful. I have, was happy to be a dependent husband and I would love to return to being a deep end husband. And it was a glorious time that we had two and a half years in Zaire, made more glorious by the fact that the Ali Foreman fight was in Zaire at that time. 
And so I translated, translated in loose terms for Muhammad Ali, who was in Kinshasa uh, for the heavyweight fight. And uh, then when I got back, uh, found out that the people we had worked, I had worked with before were now in the White House. Don Rumsfeld was chief of staff of the White House. Dick Cheney was number two. And um, the day we got back, the Cheneys gave us a welcome back lunch in the White House. And uh, it was quite a kind of amazing. Soon thereafter, Rumsfeld became secretary of defense. And uh, he asked me to be his special assistant and help him on all the testimony and speeches he had. Uh, but um, so he asked you to be his assistant. Like, yeah, how like how do you I guess I'm still looking for the, like the meat. Like, so, I mean, because I mean, I'm sure many people want to learn, you know, how do you like rise to positions of power? Well, that's why I told you, Brad, at the beginning, I don't uh, think there's any great formula. It would seem in my situation is uh, very fanciful and uh, all by chance. I mean, there's no real uh <laughs> I intention that, oh, I'm going to work for Don Rumsfeld and he's going to be Secretary of Defense someday. I mean, it never happened that way or 28-year-old Dick Cheney was going to amount to much of anything. Okay, uh, okay, I see, I see. So maybe I was just missing the timeline. So what you were saying is you developed these relationships with people before they um, had significant power and then just kept those relationships. Yeah, they weren't even working in foreign affairs. They were okay, working okay. on that's, that's the war on poverty. And so okay. it, it was all a bunch of luck. Okay, I see, I see. Okay, so yeah, keep taking us then through uh, through your career. So then we lived in Africa. Rumsfeld became Secretary of Defense, asked me to do his um, speeches for him. And uh, I said, that sounds like fun. It was kind of fun. And so it was the second time I was working for Rumsfeld. And then um, while I was at Georgetown, uh, one of my professors, a favorite professor, was Jean Kirkpatrick. And uh, <clears throat> so she... Uh, and I really liked her. And uh, then, you know, Ronald Reagan is, seems like the nominee in 1980. Uh, I was asked by Dick, Chan Dick Allen just by chance again, because he read an article that I had written. Uh, would I join the advisory committee for candidate Reagan? He said, I'm not much of a joiner. I, uh, it doesn't sound like it's very interesting to me. And uh, then Gene Kirkpatrick urged me to do it, and not to be a pill about it. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And so uh, then <laughs> Gene wanted me to work with her at the UN and to be her deputy up there. I explained that I was in Washington with the two girls in school. My wife was, you know, working in Washington and, you know, really didn't care that much about going to New York and joining the UN. She hired somebody else. And then in the April of that year, which was uh, 1981, she called up out of the blue, said, Ken, this is Jean. And I said, hi, Jean, how are you? And she says, uh, I want you to be my deputy. I said, Jean, you asked me that in November. And I told you, you know, I wasn't very interested. And besides, you got a deputy. You hired somebody. She says, well, I know I hired somebody, but I don't like him and he doesn't like me. And so I said, well, that's two problems. And so she said, why don't you come up, spend the day, bring Carol with you. And uh, have you ever been to the UN? I said, no. And she says, come, you know, up, walk around with me all day. Uh, you'll learn about the UN and, uh, you know, we'll see. I said, well, that's kind of nice. Whether I end up there or not, sounds like kind of fun. So we toodle up the next morning. Spent the day with her going around the Security Council, the General Assembly, the UN building. And um, that night she gave a dinner with some members of the staff. And after dinner, she sat on the couch and she says, as uh, Mahalia Jackson once said, is you is or is you ain't? <laughs> and I said, well, it's all right with me. You have to talk to Carol here. She'd have to be disrupted in all kinds of professional and personal ways. And uh, so we talked about it and uh, it was a go. So I spent two years at the UN, had a wonderful, wonderful time. And then uh, Ronald Reagan decided to open to that the existing arms control director that he had hired, Gene Rostow, a very nice man, uh, was not doing the job he wanted it to do. And he asked me to take that job. 
And how, like, I guess, help me understand how these things work. Like the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., what are what are the goals for that job? The goals for that job under President Reagan was to represent American interests in a very forthright manner and uh, to take on the third world that in that time was very much aligned with uh, the Soviet Union and at least in many ways we saw, take on the Soviet Union, take on the UN as being very unfair. And so we did a lot of what's called the rights of reply. So the, when someone gave his speech criticizing the United States, we'd pop up and defend ourselves. And as Ronald Reagan described it, uh, <clears throat> when he came up to the UN and met with us, it was kind of to take off the sign on our back that said, kick me. <laughs> and that's how Reagan thought of it. Before that time, it would have been a lot of, uh, you know, the UN ganging up on the United States and the United States representative being reluctant to be forceful and uh, <clears throat> just stand up clearly, uh, explicitly for American interests. And um, were there uh, were there like specific goals during your time there that that you, you set out to accomplish? Yes, I was in charge. Jean put me in charge besides her deputy. Uh, she put me in charge of the third committee, which was on disarmament and arms control. And what we did up there in terms of the nuclear issue was to really strengthen the uh, nonproliferation treaty. And this was the one area where the uh, Soviet ambassador and my counterpart, the number two, and I so uh, I'd I because we both wanted to strengthen the nonproliferation treaty. So we worked um, measures up there to do that. Um, what were those measures and in, in which countries were the, the trouble countries? Well, what we the measures were to have uh, resolutions at the United Nations supporting the nonproliferation treaty, urging countries to use peaceful means of nuclear power, that's fine, but not to go in and have uh, nuclear weaponry. And, uh, you know, at that time, we were fearful of uh, India and Pakistan. We, uh, Israel was kind of a covert. Um, North Korea, we were fearful of, but there was not any activity at that time that North Korea was getting nuclear weapons. So all these were, you know, countries that we're watching, besides, uh, you know, like South Africa, uh, now forgotten, was very tempted to get nuclear weapons. Didn't and, they have nuclear weapons and they gave them up? Or? Well, I don't know that, okay? They were certainly down the road to getting nuclear weapons, and that was at the end of the 80s. Uh, I don't know if they ever acquired nuclear weapons or not. And so it's not proliferation treaty, so... How like, but how does it actually stop countries from getting them if they want to get them? Well, it has no enforcement me mechanism. What it says in b basic is that um, there is a legitimate goal for peaceful use of nuclear weapons, uh, of nuclear energy, and uh, you know we are going to help countries that want to have nuclear uh, power but uh, <clears throat> that uh, we very much, the treaty says, you, when you sign here, you are pledging not to have a nuclear weapon, okay? Mm -hmm. Not to build a bomb. Now, some countries have signed and violated that, like North Korea, quite clearly. Uh, I think Iran signed. Others didn't sign. India never signed. Israel never signed. So they never violated it. But uh, they broke the spirit of the international community in, because, uh, you know, the international community wanted uh, a restraint on nuclear weapons. And let me just tell you, uh, Brett, that um, it's not very well known, but the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty done under President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, uh, is one of the most successful treaties in the world. Why do I say that? Because in 1962, President Kennedy gave a speech 
that he predicted that by the 1970s, there would be 20 nuclear weapon states. Okay? When Kennedy predicted that, there were five, the five major powers at the UN. When the 1970s happened, there weren't 20 nuclear weapon states, as Kennedy predicted. They were, I think, seven. Okay? Well, one of Parkinson's best laws is the success of a policy is best determined by the dire consequences that do not happen. And this was a case where uh, compared to the expectations, at least that President Kennedy had about nu nuclear proliferation and, and countries that would get the bomb, uh, this has been a roaring success. And um, now I'm asking maybe not for the policy, but just your perspective. You know, given everything, everyone you've spoken to, and every everything, you know, everything that you've been a part of, what's actually stopping that there from being more uh, nuclear weapons? Is it just fear that the U.S. will get really mad and like, you know, use all of our our weight to hurt the country in other ways? If just say like, let's, let's say Sweden, they certainly have enough scientists there and have new like they know enough that Sweden could become a nuclear power over a weekend if they wanted to. Um, what's stopping, maybe not Sweden because they're just too nice or something, but what's stopping a country like that? Um, what's actually stopping it? Because, you know, these pledges, these pieces of papers, these promises, I understand they would look bad if they broke that, but like, what's the real method that we're using to keep that number down to what, like eight or nine right now? Well, it's a very good question, Brett. I think there are various uh, answers to that. Number one is they don't feel a dire need to do so, okay? Why is that? Because of the nuclear, what we call the nuclear umbrella of the United States, that we have their security. In the uh, case of Sweden, it's going to be reinforced by, I believe, July, when they uh, join NATO formally and feel that within NATO, or at least with Sweden, getting a uh, status that's kind of uh, <clears throat> next to NATO, that, uh, you know, their uh, security will be protected in some manner. Okay, so, okay, so it is, st it's still yeah, security. There are just, other it, factors. It, it, yeah. I think one factor is that their country signed a treaty. And if they're going to, if they're a free country, uh, a, dem a, a democracy, then they don't want to, be shown as clearly violating it, okay? So then they would withdraw. When they would would draw from a treaty that they had signed, people would say, come on, that's bad form. That really is a bad thing. The alternative would be just to break it, which they could easily do, and <clears throat> being still a member of that treaty. But, you know, if the advantage of a free a country is that they have lots of uh, outside institutions that would investigate that and report on it. There's the press, there's the opposition party, there's the parliament, etc. <laughs> sure, but if it was in their best interest, yeah, I guess I'm wondering if there's some like, if we're sending, you know, if the U.S. is doing something other than just signing the treaty to make sure that countries don't pursue nuclear programs. Or if a we're lot just of times, A lot of times we have helped them on their peaceful nuclear energy. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's that's definitely one. Um, that's right. I'm and, glad and that you brought stop. that up because that's a great one, right? Like, that would stop if yeah. they were uh, if they were shown to be developing a nuclear device. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, secondly, are there are um, various uh, ties that we would have to countries that when they go nuclear, we stop those ties. With India, there was a whole. It was all too contemporary, if you ask me, but there's a whole two, uh, list of, of uh, conventional weapons and sharing of technology and sharing of cultural, et cetera, that stopped after nuclear, after India became a nuclear power. Yeah. Are there, are, are there countries that you worry about today where it's like our economic, our economic and our defense relationships are not probably not strong enough to stop them if they felt it if they felt it was really in their best interest 
like Turkey or something. I don't know. I'm just making something up or Kazakhstan or something in the Middle East where it's like, we, you know, we, yeah, we do some business you know, more so with Turkey, obviously, and they're NATO. OK, so maybe that's not the best example. Maybe like Kazakhstan. Like, you know, we don't like what do they care if you know we put economic sanctions on them, if they really thought it was in their best interest? And they have nuclear scientists. I think they've got some former nuclear facilities also. If they were really afraid that like Georgia was going to invade them or something and the U.S. wasn't extending our umbrella to them, what would – yeah, what, how how would we stop them from developing nuclear weapons? I think uh, the biggest worry today, Brett, would be, first of all, obviously North Korea uh, having you know, clear nuclear weapons and testing them, et cetera. Uh, on the verge of nuclear weapons, I think the main uh, the main threat would be uh, unraveling of the existing institutions and presumptions that we have. If the Arab countries were going to see that uh, Israel's policies are far more antagonistic towards its neighbors, toward the Palestinians within. Uh, occupied Israel, um, they would really get uh, very fearful that uh, and and think that they needed to bolster their own uh, defense more. That would be Saudi Arabia. <laughs> that would be Egypt. Well, Egypt, yeah. Like, why doesn't Egypt have nuclear weapons? That like like we we're not particularly nice to them and. And vice versa. We give know. them a few billion dollars a year. So okay, so that's the way we're doing. <laughs> we are particularly yeah. okay. nice. I see. I see. I see. We're we're paying them off in that case. We but, pay them yeah, off. I'm trying to explore have, what are all we, the tools we have, that we have defense, at our disposal. We have a defense uh, sharing with them that we give them weapons. We have I see. That's overall diplomatic yeah. relations that are very nice. Now and, and, and is, so. And is there like a giant like chart on a whiteboard somewhere in government mm -hmm. where it's like here are the 190 countries. Here's our strategy for each one. Okay, this one we're going to use mostly economic tools. This one we're going to use groups like NATO. This one we're going to use defense relationships. This one we're going to use threats. It, th is that like plotted out somewhere? No. Uh, what is uh, done is that there is a determination on the nonproliferation and the spread of nuclear weapons as part of the overall relationship with that country. So we would like to do everything we can to keep the ties with that country so that it there isn't more uh, push for getting the bomb. Okay, so it's just all the above. It's not like very strategic, like, you know, someone deciding like this is our Japan strategy. This is our... Australia. Strategy. Yes, but this is our Japan strategy in terms of trade, in terms of defense cooperation. Uh, you know, are there any signs that that uh, Japan would go nuclear? Uh, because it certainly has the te technical capability of doing so. And they're in a in a hot spot <laughs> of a region, also. Yeah, and there would be regional if if, nuke, if uh, North Korea steps up. It's a nuclear arsenal a lot, and it's threats towards Japan. And if the new, if the United States steps down on its uh, relationship with Japan, if China steps up on its threats to Japan, <coughs> uh, then the uh, Japanese would figure, you know, no one's going to come to our aid. Uh, we're going to have to come to their aid. And um, you know, when that happens. Uh, it's very nice to have nuclear weapons. Yeah, and then what about Taiwan and what about South Korea? How come? How come they don't have? I mean, to me, I would not trust the U.S. would be there if worst came to worst. Like, I'd want my own nuclear weapons if I were either of those countries. Well, I'm very happy, Brett, that you're here interviewing me and not President of South Korea or Taiwan. All right, <laughs> because they want defense uh the defense ties with the united states to continue we have 20,000 i we used to have 20,000 i don't know the number now around 20,000 us soldiers in south korea to south korea when I, I get a little bit more but if i were them i'd still want to have the threat directly pushed back against north korea like you do anything to us we'll wipe you off the face of the earth not like we'll call our big brother to wipe you off the face of the earth okay uh, you would want that, but you would have to, if you want, if you proceeded that way, Brett, you'd have to consider 
that the United States is going to do some things to break the ties that have stayed with us for the last 50 years. Uh, and that's a cost that you're going to uh, take. Now, if you're willing to pay that cost, then yeah. proceed right ahead. But you could also you call pay- call U.S.'s bluff. Like, would we really end our trade relations? We might pull our troops out, but that would be a good thing anyway in some ways. Would we really? Not to me. Not to me. <laughs> I think our troops in South Korea are uh, what, very. Yeah, what are our troops doing? Like, what are our troops there for? They're for there for a conventional war, right? They're there for deterrence, yes. And the the threat is a conventional war could end up nuclear when you are involved with a nuclear country like North Korea. Right, but I'm, maybe I don't understand how our troops there prevent that from escalating. Because what you don't want is the start of a conventional war. Yeah. Which could then escalate into nuclear weapons. I see. So it's just like, yeah, I mean, that kind of sucks for our troops. They're, they're almost there. Yeah, they're there as a tripwire. It yeah, sucks exactly. for our yeah, troops. Exactly. Yeah. And and yeah. you're absolutely right. If yeah, the tripwire was yeah. ever going to be tripped. Yeah. Okay, that but makes sense. As, as long as it's a tripwire, your troops are in good shape. That yep. That makes a lot of sense, actually. And then what about the Taiwan situation? Talk me through the the, the thinking in Taiwan, because that's the one I think everyone's most worried about right now. Like if if they were attacked, we don't really have troops in Taiwan, right? That's correct. We have uh billions of dollars of uh, military equipment that we give them we are the main supplier of military equipment uh if they went nuclear uh there's real jeopardy that that equipment could be there are two things that could happen if they went nuclear right number one is the united states could either diminish or end its ties to taiwan number two the chinese would be provoked to start a war uh against taiwan and to reclaim Doesn't Taiwan. Doesn't that go against right. mutually assured destruction? Why would they no, start? Why would they start no, a war? Because, and, yeah. because they would have signs that Taiwan was on the verge or in the process of getting nuclear weapons, mm-hmm. and uh, they would decide that that's it. We we have wanted to uh, reunite China for years. Uh, so we've so said they that. use the escalation as the excuse for invasion. And yeah. then does it go the other way? If if ta- Taiwan thinks it's imminent that they're going to get invaded anyway, and like just knowing U.S. public sentiment, I mean, do you, I don't think the U.S. would support like going in to protect Taiwan, even though we're obligated to. I can't imagine the U.S. public actually supporting like putting like a major, major U.S. lives at stake if China wanted to reclaim Taiwan. So I what I could you think a U.S. public who who, who yeah. which voting group? Uh, you don't look at the voting group. You look at a crisis happening and you say that we just don't want countries, especially totalitarian countries like Russia and China, to uh, be invading their neighbor. Now, I understand that Taiwan is a special case because we've always said <clears throat> there's one China, but two different systems. But. Uh, over the last 50 years, 70 years, whatever it is, uh, Taiwan has had its own individuality, its own success, its own standing in the world, and uh, its own relationship with the United States. So totally, just totally. Want, I, I'm just thinking about voting. I'm just thinking about the voting public. I just, I just know what I public know that would doesn't want. like doesn't like aggressors overseas. It yeah, but it's not, like much, with Ukraine war, it's not like we're sending troops over there, right? Because that would be politically untenable, right? And that's and that's I don't know, I don't know if that's and, true. and they look and they look like us. You know, it's like I just can't imagine a war breaks out between Taiwan and China and, and the US public voting for us our involvement. I just can't imagine that. Okay, well your imagination is uh, I, I understand what your imagination is, but I can't imagine it. Okay. Uh, that uh, a threat against Taiwan would be a threat against you know the free countries of Asia. Uh, it would be aggressive. Uh, Japan would certainly see it as a threat against itself, and we have a great, great interest in Japan. South Korea would see it as a threat against itself, and we have a great interest in South Korea. We have a great interest in prosperity of Taiwan that now makes 90% of our microchips uh, which we don't want to totally, lose. totally. No, I know yeah. we would. I know we try to stop it. I know it's in yeah. our interest. I just can't imagine sending troops, us sending troops, and like putting U.S. lives 
at stake. But okay, I mean that's just two different perspectives. D- right. Tell me about the tell me about the Star Wars program. That's always like a classic favorite. Tell me, what what should people know about the Star Wars program? Well, the first thing thing is that uh, it shouldn't be called Star Wars. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I know what you mean. It's yeah. the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. It is uh, next month. Uh, it's going to be 40 years since Ronald Reagan made a uh, announcement of it. And uh, basically, it was the whole um, debate at the Reykjavik Summit in October of 1986 that I recount in the book called Reagan at Reykjavik that is going to be uh, made into a series, a television series with Michael Douglas starring as Ron Reagan and Christoph Waltz as um, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, and the girl with the dragon tattoo, Rapace, as uh, Raisa Gorbachev. And um, Paramount and Sky TV are going to put this on. And uh, what SDI did was to change the whole um, thinking about deterrence of nuclear weapons from mutually assured destruction, which I destroy you and you destroy me. And we have, as Ronald Reagan envisioned it, two uh, gunslingers with their guns at each other's heads. So if you pull the trigger, I'm pulling the trigger too. He decided that after 40, 50, 60 years of living like that, that wasn't the best way to organize the world, the nuclear issue. We should have protection as well as, uh, or instead of this uh, provocative approach. And so he wanted research for protection against incoming ballistic missiles. And I could tell you now, 40 years after the SDI speech, that the research has done very well, that a lot of the threats that are limited from uh, countries like Iran or countries like North Korea would be uh, handled by the Strategic Defense Initiative so that a president would not have the twin alternatives of either launching a retaliatory attack, say against North Korea and wiping out that country because its leaderships have attacked the United States either that approach of wiping out North Korea or doing nothing and saying, we're awfully sorry that nuclear weapons land in the United States. We're not going to retaliate uh, and we're going to bring it up at the UN or something like that. So, so what is that those, third those two, yeah. those two alternatives are terrible. Ronald Reagan wanted a third alternative, yep. which is let's stop the incoming ballistic missile before it lands here. Yeah, so what what are, what is the actual way that we stop incoming ICBMs? You launch a uh, rocket that is very fast, very accurate, that uses very high tech uh, <clears throat> detection and uh, retargeting uh, that um, hits the incoming ballistic missile either in mid flight, well, it's easiest in the original flight, but then in mid flight or in the terminal phase. And the controversy behind all this was at first they wanted to do it with lasers or something. What was the what was the issue? The main there? controversy was various controversies. Number one, that it upset the strategic framework that was at the uh, heart of nuclear weapons uh, forty years ago when Ronald Reagan made the speech. That was Robert McNair's mutually assured destruction, the MAD doctrine, which was prevailing. This disruptive. Secondly. The, um, the uh, groups of organized scientists in the world, the uh, <clears throat> concerned scientists, uh, atomic scientists, uh, and other organizations said it would never work. SDI will never work. Now, why scientists would say something would never work, mm-hmm. regardless of the amount of research, regardless of the time frame? It's kind of ridiculous, if you ask me. I always thought it was absolutely insane. I mean, yeah, I feel that way too. But I actually didn't realize that they got it working. So is there like an accuracy? So I guess lasers thing, they maybe stop that line of... Yes. 
approach, and now they're just trying to do it missile on – like a missile is supposed to hit a missile or something. That's right. You have a big ballistic missile or a big warhead, and a little rocket goes and, do we, and, and smashes and do we do it. Do we do non-nuclear tests? Like do we practice launching an ICBM yes. out of a silo, and then we – hit it with a smaller rocket or something? Yes, that has happened in uh, over the years. We have a whole agency, the Missile Defense Agency, that uh, conducts those kind of tests, and they've proven in recent years to be very, very effective. Very effective. How, re how recent in, and how effective? Very effective in a limited nuclear engagement. Okay? So when you're talking about Iran and you're talking about North Korea, you're talking about one, two, three, six nuclear weapons, okay? Against Russia or China that has a whole large number of yeah. nuclear weapons, they would not be effective. And how and how come we don't just scale up whatever we have? So if we have like, you know, three or four or 10 of these um, missile on missiles and they cost, you know, to, let's say the whole thing costs $100 billion, you know, we just spent six trillion in a year on COVID. Why don't we just scale that up, and then we've got four hundred or five hundred ready to go? Well, for various reasons. Number one is uh, people don't like to spend a trillion dollars. <laughs> that but that mostly spending. go to like, I mean, it would it would be an injection to the economy, right? It's like mostly U.S. workers. No, it wouldn't be an injection to the economy. It would be uh, money that the government spent for this that they weren't spending for other projects or they shouldn't be spending because the American people can spend the money better than the government. Mm. Uh, okay. Okay. Number two is the more incoming ballistic missiles you have, the more confusing it is to target and to hit the, uh, the incoming ballistic missiles. In, in other words, uh, when one or two are coming in, you can see it, you can concentrate on it, you can go get it. Uh, when These you aren't have, people doing it. It's computers doing it. Like it's like right, it's like but it's, right? it's 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 very confusing. Interesting. Um, yeah, I guess I just didn't know that we had this like working system up and running. Um, yes, it, it's it's doing very well on limited engagements. And when when did when was the last time we did like a physical test? Did they make these things public at all? Yes, they're public, and it's at the websites of the missile Def missile defense agency. They'll report on a uh, on a test for years. The tests weren't very successful because it's very hard. I have a friend who used to uh, be CEO and chairman of Lockheed Martin and was involved in the uh, landing on the moon and the moon projects. And he said, hitting a bullet with another bullet in space is more difficult than what we did landing a man on the moon. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. It wasn't, of course, of course, to me. Uh, that surprised me that he said that. Well, they landed a, a man on the moon with like a toast, like with a you know computer that was, you know, dumber than today's toasters. Right. But um, yeah, I guess I am. I'm surprised to hear that you're not in favor of scaling up the program. Because like, if it's useful to have at all, why not make it actually useful for real engagement? Because now it's only really useful, I guess, if like one of only two or three countries we got mad at, but it's not useful to protect us from Russia or China. It's useful for more than that, Brett. It's useful for a country that has limited nuclear weapons. It's useful for a breakaway of a major nuclear state. So if there would be a breakaway from Pakistan or breakaway from uh, Russia or breakaway from a terrorist situation for Chinese, they would only get a limited number of mm. nuclear weapons and we could handle we could handle something like that. I see, I see, I see. And do you think it's only a matter of time or do you think the the threat is pretty much like we're in a good spot, like where we might continue as humanity for the next two, three hundred years without a nuclear bomb going off? Uh, I think it is so far so good. And uh, that we have to stay diligent. We have to stay. I think uh, SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative that Ronald Reagan uh, made, uh, come about, and the research that wonderful scientists have done since that time uh, re reinforces the idea that it doesn't have to, the United States and the world does not have to be blown up. That we can have a future that is, uh, you know, a future free from nuclear attacks.
The fact yeah. is, I'll tell you, it's, yeah. it's amazing, Brett, that um, since August 6, 1945, nuclear weapons have never been used in a combat situation. Now, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, if on amazing. August 7, anybody told me that, uh, 1945, I would have said that's fanciful. That's just, you know, pie in the sky. You're just an idealist. But the fact is that that has happened. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I hope I hope it doesn't happen. And what I really hope is that it doesn't happen at a small scale where it just becomes commonplace, you know, like where they just use like something that blows up a city block instead of a city. And then it's like, well, now now it's on the table. And then it's like a city block one year, and then it's like ten city blocks the next year in a different combat situation, and then it just and then it just becomes like commonplace. I think that would probably be one. Well, of the, the 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 main threat there, Brett, the more realistic threat was is if uh, Putin would use nuclear weapons in Ukraine on a battlefield uh, at Bratis, and if Putin is losing the war in a more dramatic way than he is even now, uh, that is a possibility. I don't think it's a likelihood, but it is a possibility. And that would be very severe. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Can you game plan that out for us? What happens if he decides to do that? What's what's our response then? If I were running the world, uh, which I'm not, by the way, uh, I would say that the United States and all of NATO would get very much more involved in winning the Ukraine war, which I hope happens. We get more uh, involved how? Because it's like the, what, the, it's the Russian naval fleet in the Black Sea. And and that wouldn't then just escalate if, if he dropped one bomb for normal stuff, if we wiped out his fleet, wouldn't he then drop a bigger one and be like, you better stop it. Like, I'm not messing around. No, if he did that, you know, the, Russia would be wiped out. And you'd go back to nuclear. So we we drop nuclear bombs then. Yes. Okay. If, so if, so you think that's okay? So you think that's how it plays out? If he drops a bomb. No. If he has a tactical nuclear weapon use on battlefield. Yeah. In, in um, in Ukraine. Yeah. I think the response would be a massive NATO conventional retaliation against Russia. <laughs> not not nuclear, but uh, conventional. And it would do enormous damage to all the troops, Russian troops in Ukraine, to the Baltic Sea. And he just uh, sits there and takes it and, he, and with his tail between his legs because he doesn't want to drop a bigger bomb at that point, you're saying. If he drops a bigger bomb, there's the real threat of wiping out Russia. Yeah. Even if it's not against us, even if it's a bigger bomb just on Kiev. Yes. We wipe out Russia in that case. I don't know. We yeah. have a massive retaliation with conventional weapons, which would do an enormous amount of damage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. I guess this is why everyone was a little worried and why it got so much attention this last year, because we went so long with it almost seeming like nuclear weapons were a thing of the distant past. And we've still gone that way. We've still on yeah. that path, Brett. So don't yeah. be real discouraging about that. Yeah, I know. I know. It's just like this is now a pretty big war with the country that's got the most nuclear weapons. It seems. But yeah. after a year, after a year, what we've learned is that uh, nuclear weapons have not been used, that uh, the prohibition, the general prohibition against the use of nuclear weapons starting in uh, August, early August of 1945 has helped. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess I am worried that this war is not over yet, and there might be certain actions that we take that make him feel like he's backed into a corner. I think that's the worry, right? If like there's right lots now of worries, that's yeah. lots of worries. I'm not interested in worrying about Putin being backed into a corner. I'm worried about the Ukrainians getting their country back, even at the cost of backing him into a corner and escalating yes. to full on nuclear. Really. Not not the latter part, because I don't believe that that would happen. But backing him and in, Putin into a corner doesn't bother me at all. You don't think that Putin backed into a corner would start using nuclear weapons? 
Not necessarily, no. Uh -uh. Why not, though? Well, because the Chinese, have one of the few things the Chinese have said that are <clears throat> clear in this whole engagement is that uh, there'll be real consequences for Russia to use nuclear weapons. Russia right now is one major ally, and that's China. And so you'd be paying attention to that. Number yeah. two is the United States has all, and NATO, has all kinds of military power that they're not using right now that would be unleashed by the outrage of Putin using nuclear weapons. And it's conventional power. Yeah. But it's pretty it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um yeah. Uh well, all right. Well, um any other before we wrap up today, any other kind of just thoughts you want to leave us with from your, you know, experience all these years and where you the think thought, things are going? The or? thought the thought uh Brett would be that well, there over the years has been enormous worry about nuclear weapons and <clears throat> fear of nuclear weapons. Uh, the track record has been better than anybody expected. Okay, yeah. so let's celebrate that. On the use of nuclear power for uh, <clears throat> purposes of uh, generation of electricity and other kinds of power, uh, again, the nuclear record has been better than anybody expected. Uh, you know, the, the, you have the Three Mile Island um, accident in the United States, which as I remember, didn't kill anybody. You had the Japanese accident, which was more because of the tsunami there that was <clears throat> fearful, but uh, the nuclear part didn't really kill anybody, as I understand it. Uh, you had Chernobyl, where the nuclear accident did kill people and uh was devastating just terrible terrible a time i was in office at that time uh, but the fact is a they had very bad equipment that no one in the world would ever use today they broke all the procedures even for that equipment it was just a screw up from the start to finish the use of peaceful nuclear power has been uh, quite successful in an amazing way uh, since that time. So the two things I would celebrate are the restraint on nuclear weapons use uh, and even development, I would say, is more restrained than it was. Number two, the tremendous promise that nuclear can, uh, <clears throat> nuclear power has for pe peaceful purposes. Okay, well, that's a great note to end on. Ken Edelman, everybody, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye -bye. Okay, bye-bye. and initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.